Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where I write a game engine from scratch. One of the most important aspects, if not the most important aspect, of any software program is the user experience, provided that it was made to be used by a human, of course. Although it seems that we collectively have forgotten about this fact, if we look at the state of most commercial software we use on a daily basis, we all agree that we prefer programs that won't make us want to cut off our own limbs with a rusty saw, because that would make for a less agonizing experience. I can think of three properties that in my opinion make for a pleasant user experience. First, stability and robustness, i.e. don't crash and don't have bugs. The second item is intuitive user interface, so we don't have to read a lot of documentation to figure out how it works. And the third one is aesthetics, which is the look and feel of the software. This one is of course subject to personal taste, but at least we can agree that we all like consistency and order in the user interface. This item also overlaps with the second item in that the developer can communicate the intended use of an element through how it looks, for example with certain colors and shapes. So far in this video series, I have been concerned mainly with the first and a little bit with the second item. The purpose of these blue episodes is to work on the third one, which is the aesthetics of the level editor. Here I'll try to design a user interface that I think is okay to look at and will preferably give us a clue about the functionality as well. So let's start by looking at the effort of resolution necessary to the achievement of this purpose. The first thing I'd like to do is to choose a limited number of colors that I'll be using for the editor and the purpose of that is to give the editor a consistent look across all its parts. In general I like darker themes for graphic software better because then I can differentiate between different colors more easily than when there are light user interface elements around what I'm looking at. Therefore I picked six shades of gray. And there are six because nobody should feel the need for more than six shades of grey. Technically, disabled font and font colors are also shades of grey, and that would make it eight shades of grey. But that's really the maximum number of shades of grey that anyone should be comfortable with. Otherwise, it would be weird, wouldn't it? And of course, you can go darker or lighter by starting with a darker or a lighter shade of grey. But keep in mind that the human visual system has a nonlinear response to intensity of light. So for example here, if you look at the blue curve, you can see that if we increase the intensity from 0 to 25%, the perceived increase in intensity is more than 50%. And that means that we can differentiate a lot of shades of gray just in the first quarter of the intensity value. Whereas at the other end, at the bright end, when we increase the value of intensity from 75% to 100%, the perceived increase in intensity is just 20% or less. And that means that there are a lot less values allocated in this region that we can differentiate between. So that's something to keep in mind when you are designing your user interface and choosing the colors. In addition, I also have colors for red, green, and blue, and these are a bit less saturated than the pure red, green, and blue, as you can see here. And I think these are a bit less harsh on the eye. That's why I chose them to be less saturated. And I have this uh, orange color, yellow orange color that I'll be using for warnings. This selection color is obviously for selections. Like in, if you have a list of items in the list box and the background color of those selected items will be this color. So let's put this in a resource dictionary so we can use them in the editor. Now if you look at the diagram for multi-selected game entities and the multi-selected component classes that we have, um, you can see that a multi-selected transform is needed for each multi-select game entity. And each of those components 
have a list of selected components. So for example, this MS transform has a list of all the transform components that are in the list of selected game entities. So today I'm going to implement this class, MS transform, and also make the WPF control for it to display the transform. This is you, and this is your brain. Your brain is where your consciousness resides. Without it, you wouldn't experience existence. Without your brain, you wouldn't exist. Therefore, you could say that your brain is you. We could turn this into an analogy and apply it to the entities and their scripts. Since a script acts as an entity's brain and defines its behavior, from the script's point of view, the script is the entity. In object-oriented programming, whenever we are talking about an is-a relationship, it often corresponds to an inheritance hierarchy. Now remembering that we expose the entities to the game code via the entity class, it would be an obvious choice to inherit from this class and construct a base class for all the entity scripts that the game programmer will be writing. So the entity class will be the base for the entity script, which will be the base for all other script classes. And together all script classes will form the game code. These script classes act as a data for the script components of the entities in the engine. Whenever we are adding an entity, it will try and create all its components. And if one of its components is a script component, that means that we also have to create one of these entity scripts. And to do that, we need two pieces of information. First, we need to know what entity this script belongs to. And second, we need a creation function that would create an instance of the script class. Because the script component doesn't know anything about the script class, we need this creation function that will allocate memory and create an instance of that particular script class. To recap, an entity will have script components and each script component will have a pointer to an instance of the game code script somewhere in memory. Now let's see what this looks like in code. Now if we would use an array with holes like this, then we would have to check for each slot whether it has a valid pointer to an instance of a script class. And that would result in a code like this, where we go through all scripts one by one and check if that script in that slot is not a null pointer. And if that's not the case, then we can call its update function. And although this works just fine, it has two major disadvantages, which is cache misses and branch misperdictions. Cache misses are caused by the fact that the CPU reads a limited amount of memory each time it needs some data. So for example, these four slots would be fetched by the CPU and only two of those contain useful information. Whereas if we had an array without holes, then we had four pointers already which is twice as much in this case. And each time a cache miss occurs, that means that the CPU has to go to the main memory and fetch more data, which is slower. If you'd like to know more about CPU cache and memory, then the following paper might be useful to you. It's called What Every Programmer Should Know About Memory. And if you want to know everything about cache and how the CPU memory works for modern architectures, then you really need to read this paper. It explains everything that has to do with accessing memory efficiently for software applications. I'll provide the link to this paper below in the description of the video, so feel free to check that out. And the second disadvantage is branch mispredictions. Because there doesn't have to be a regularity in what slots contain valid pointers, the CPU will often be unable to predict if this branch will be taken or not. If the CPU predicts that this branch should be taken, so this function is called and the CPU is running this in a pipeline, and it turns out that that wasn't a good prediction, then all that work needs to be thrown away. Well, obviously, in this case, the update function can't be called if the script is a null pointer. But there are more things to be done before a function call, like pushing parameters onto stack. 
which the CPU might already have been doing. So to mitigate these disadvantages, I'll have a script array that's separate from this array with holes. And of course, the scripts are not components. The scripts are game code. So keep this in mind. And I'll keep the array of script pointers a tight array. So there aren't any empty slots in here. And the way we keep track of things is to use this array as an ID mapping to the array of script pointers. So these are tightly packed and we just point to these script pointers. And the script IDs are indices into this ID mapping. So here will be script ID zero and script ID two, etc. And for this ID mapping, we will of course use this uh, generational IDs that we used for game entities as well. Now, how do we make sure that this array stays tightly packed? For example, if we want to remove one of these scripts because the entity that has that script is being removed. So suppose that we want to remove this one. If we would remove this here in place, then there would be an empty spot in here, and that's not what we want. So what we want to do is to swap these two pointers. So we swap this triangle script pointer with the last one. Next, we delete the triangle script. And after that, we only need to update these indices like so. And now we are left with, again, a tightly packed array of script pointers and an ID mapping that tells us for what script ID, what script pointer should be used. Now we have ID mapping and script IDs, and that's why we call this double indexing. Okay, let's implement this in code. In this series, up until the last video, we spent time to set up this system, which consists of the game engine static library, which is written in C++, and the level editor, which is written in C-sharp.net core framework using WPF. And because we are using two different frameworks, we needed an engine DLL that exposes functionality from the engine static library to the level editor. And that way we can load this DLL in the level editor and interact with the game engine. In the last video, we added another step, which is the Visual Studio solution that contains the game code. And we again use the game engine to link with the game code and use its functionality to create the final game. In today's video, I'd like to add another step, which is the ability to load the game code as a DLL in the level editor in order to be able to actually interactively develop the game. And that means that we need to be able to have different outputs for the game code project, depending on whether we want it to be the final executable or to be loaded in the level editor as the DLL. So today I would like to work on setting this up so that we can have different types of output, depending on whether we want to use the game code with the level editor or just have the final executable and also to create a game code solution whenever we create a new game project using the level editor. Now, if we look at this diagram that I drew here, you can see that in the case of the level editor, we need the engine DLL and the game code DLL, and we want to import functions from both DLLs in the level editor. So the game code obviously contains the code for the entity scripts, and it also is linked statically with the engine. And the same is true for engine DLL. The engine DLL is statically linked with engine library, but it doesn't of course contain the game code, it's only the engine. So since the game code contains the names of the scripts, we need to import a function from this DLL that would give us the names of the scripts. So engine DLL holds the data and the engine code, for example, the data would be the instances of the entity scripts. So engine DLL would ask the creation function, which is in the game code DLL to create an instance of the entity scripts, and it would hold a pointer to that. So the game code DLL doesn't really have any data in it. 
game code DLL only holds game code and functions to instantiate them. And the communication between the two DLLs goes via the level editor. So we need to import functions from game code DLL in the level editor and then use them to retrieve information about the entity scripts and then pass them to the engine DLL so it can create those entity scripts. 